Hello, everybody, and welcome to Clackamas United Church of Christ, as we like to say in the UCC, no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. A special welcome to anyone who is with us for the first time today. We are so glad that you are here with us. And if you want to say hello in the comment section, uh, we will we will say hello back. We'll give you a nice, friendly Clackamas UCC hello. So feel free to do that. Or if you just want to sit back and hang out, that's cool too. Uh, whatever, however works for you uh, is awesome. So today, friends, is a special recorded worship service. We have a special guest preacher today. Uh, Joel Ekdahl will be preaching, and uh, always excited to hear what Joel has to say. Joel is a high school English teacher here in the Portland area, and uh, Joel always brings some good wisdom. So uh, thank you, Joel, for, for preaching today. Friends, if you have a prayer request that you would like lifted up today, I invite you to put that in the chat section with the hashtag prayer, and we will uh, that'll make it easier for us to see prayers. We're not going to lift them up as we normally do in our live services, but uh, it will make, us e make it easier for us to pray for one another uh, during our service and after our service, too. So... Uh, thank you for that. I, uh, we are going to be having a uh, coffee hour after the worship service on Zoom. So if you'd like to get together with other progressive Christians just to talk, uh, hang out for a little bit, uh, you can join us at coffee hour there. And uh, I think Raylene is going to be leading it. So <laughs> uh, I haven't asked Raylene yet. Sorry, Raylene. Uh, but um, we will we'll see. So uh, what, what other now? Oh, today is the third Sunday of Advent. We are not in the Christmas season yet. We are in the Advent season. So uh, we are just, Advent is a time of uh, waiting for the arrival of Jesus. So today we are going to light the pink candle, uh, which is the one right here. Yeah, it looks kind of white there, but uh, it's pink. And uh, thanks to Erica for making our Advent banner. The pink candle is the candle of joy. Now, many of you I am sure, have a sense that religion uh, is not about joy. It's about duty. It's about uh, feeling actually bad about yourself, uh, like uh, original sin, and you are corrupted to the core. And uh, it just is like, that kind of religion is just like a wet blanket. It's like a, it's like a monkey on your back. Uh, and you just take, that, take off that wet blanket. That's what I want to tell you to do. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you to do that, uh, but I'm going to invite you to just take that off. Why? Because uh, religion should give us a sense of joy. Uh, and Jesus in John chapter 15 says that he came to give us joy, that we might participate in his joy. Does, does, that, does that shift things for you? When I, when I first read that, I was like, wow, Jesus came for our joy, to give us more joy. You know, you may have heard Jesus came to uh, forgive us from our sins or to appease the wrath of God. That's the worst one that I've heard. Um, but, no, but Jesus came that we might have joy, that his joy might be complete in us. So if religion causes you to uh, feel bad, to not have joy, to have like, to just feel guilty all the time, um, invite you to do something different with it. Invite you to, uh, to think, oh, God loves me, uh, and that's awesome, and that's joyful, and sometimes during, like, winter, it can feel very dark and despairing, and if that's where you're at, that's okay. Uh, that's okay. Uh, and if in the midst of that darkness and despair, you might be able to find a little bit of joy here and there, that's okay, too. So, uh, today, we will light the Advent candle of joy. Uh, we are going to have our Christmas uh, thanks, uh, our Christmas turkey and ham giveaway uh, later in the month on December twenty first, twenty second, and twenty third at the church. Uh, so from six to seven thirty, or until supplies run out. So if you would like to uh, help us pass out hams, uh, let me know. Uh, turkeys and hams, and um, if you need a turkey and or a ham. 
come on by the church and uh, no questions asked, we'll give you a turkey or, or a ham. We'll do our best while supplies last. So uh, friends, I think that those are all of, oh, I'm feeling a little sick. So it's uh, cold and flu season. So I just, this is not fun. I, my throat hurts and the more I talk, the more it hurts. So I'm going to I'm going to shut up here in a little bit. <laughs> so, um, but uh, just be careful out there. Uh, might be, uh, it's always smart to wear a mask. If you want to wear a mask, uh, feel, please do so. Um, and uh, just be careful because all these colds, the viruses and things, they're no fun. So uh, just encourage you to be careful. So friends, uh, let us enter into our worship service today with some prelude music from Jean Herrera. Our tradition here at CUCC is to light a peace candle at the beginning of each worship service to center ourselves around the peace of God. I invite you to join us in lighting the peace candle. We pray for peace in our hearts, in our homes, in our communities, in our nations, and in our worlds. Amen. So today's scripture reading comes from the Gospel of Matthew, 
chapter 11, verses 2 through 11. When John heard in prison what the Messiah was doing, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or are we to wait for another? Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and what you see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the leapers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised, and the poor have good news brought to them. And blessed is anyone who takes no offense at me. As they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to look at? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? Someone dressed in soft robes? Look, those who wear soft robes are in royal palaces. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written. See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way before you. Truly, I tell you, among those born of women, no one has arisen greater than John the Baptist. Yet the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Here ends our scripture reading. May we take time to reflect upon it. Please join us in the call to worship. We come from many different places to gather today. For wide is God's welcome and you are welcome here. If you are young, old, or in the middle, you are welcome here. If you are black, brown, Asian, or white, you are welcome here. If you're single, married, never married, divorced, or widowed, you are welcome here. If you are lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, or straight, you are welcome here. If you are happy, or sad, healthy, or ailing, you are welcome here. If you believe in God some of the time, none of the time, or all of the time, you are welcome here. So come, let us worship our welcoming God. Friends, today we light the Advent candle of joy. Let us light the Advent candle of joy, knowing that the light of God is within us as we prepare for Christ's coming on Christmas. Let us pray. Let this candle of Advent joy shine in all our hearts this week to remind us to pray and praise and place Christ at the center of the season. Amen. Friends, we come to the moment where we pass the peace. I invite you to type peace in the chat section as we pass the peace to one another. Beloved of God, may the peace of Christ be with you. Hello, children of God. Today I want to talk to you about something that's called patience. In the verse and passage we've read today, People are wondering, is God really in charge? Is God doing all that he can to create a world of peace, love, and justice? Or has God abandoned us? And I'll be honest, there are times when I get impatient too. There are times when I feel that not enough good is happening in this world. So today I want to talk about patience, and I want to not talk about it in the context of our world, but I wanna talk about it in the context of learning. As most of you know, I am a teacher by trade. 
And I am always very attuned to the way people learn. And I want to tell you that over the years, as I've watched students grow in their reading and writing and their critical thinking and their discussion skills and their, in their presentation skills, I will tell you that the people who succeed are the ones who have what we call a growth mindset. They don't see their own failures as a sign that they are dumb or incapable of learning. They see it as a minor setback, a piece of constructive criticism, something they will learn, use to learn and to grow. They are the ones who come back stronger on every assignment and continue to flourish as they grow from freshmen to seniors. Now there are other students who see one red mark on their paper and say, I'm a bad writer and I will never be a good writer. There are students who get a bad grade on a math test or a science test and say math and science isn't for me. And they are shutting down a valuable part of their minds, the part of their minds that is elastic, that is able to grow. Because if you walk into your life and you say, I am not good at that, I am not good at this. And to extend it further, if you say humans are not good, the world is not good, our government is bad, people don't care about me then you will never be open to the growth that is happening right under your feet. You will not be aware of the good that is happening, the acts of service that people are doing to each other, because you will assume that all humans are like what they were in that moment where you were disappointed. Just in the same way that you, as a learner, assume that you will always be bad at writing or always be bad at math or always unable to give public speeches. So today and this week, children of God, I pray that you will have a growth mindset. Not only does that mean that you will look at the world with fresh new eyes and believe that you can do anything through Christ, but it means to look for the growth that is happening around us all the time. Thank you, everyone. Friends, we now enter into the time of sharing our offerings with the church. We give thanks for your generosity as it goes to supporting the wonderful missions that we have here at Clackamas United Church of Christ. So if you would like to help us financially in supporting our missions and you have the means to do so, uh, we would be so grateful. We know that this is a tough time of year. It's a tough time 
for a, a lot of us financially. And uh, so um, if you have the means and the willingness, uh, we would be so grateful. Uh, if not, that's okay too. Uh, we're always gonna, we're gonna be here. We're gonna be here to support one another and care for one another. So, but if you can help us out, uh, there are a number of ways that you can do that. You can give through uh, Facebook or YouTube at the donate button. You can also go to our website, c-ucc.org, where you can go to the giving button there. You can also send a check to our PO box if you would like to do that. So friends, let us pray over our offerings now. Gracious God, we give thanks for these gifts and for the opportunity to share them. We ask that you bless them, that they might be used to your glory to spread your peace and love and justice throughout our communities and throughout the world. With them, we offer all that we have and all that we are in praise and thanksgiving to you. We pray in the name of the Risen One. Amen. Friends, we invite you to join us in our community prayer. We will end each petition with a statement, God in your love, and we invite you to respond with, hear our prayer. Let us pray. Blessed are you, our, our God, creator of the universe. You form us in your image and call us to be a blessing. You baptize us in your love and strengthen us with your Holy Spirit. We gather this day to pray for your world and your people. We remember all of those who are suffering and in need of healing in mind, body, or soul. Comfort those who are anxious and in pain. Strengthen those who are weak and lead us to be healers of one another. God, in your love, hear our prayers. We pray for all those who are mourning the loss of loved ones. We pray for your presence in times of grief and for the reinsurance that our loved ones live eternally in your glory. God, in your love, mm -hmm. hear our prayers. We pray for your creation that you have entrusted to our care for the wisdom and will to deal with climate change. We pray for all of those who are living in the midst of war and violence as we pray for an end to all war and violence. God in your love, hear our prayer. We pray for the leaders of this nation and all nations that they might enact policies that will spread your justice, freedom and peace among all peoples. We pray for those serving our country and for those serving other countries. And we pray for the will and courage to serve one another. We pray as Jesus teaches for those we call our enemies, as we anticipate the day when we have no enemies. God, in your love, hear our prayer. We pray for all of those who are hungry, thirsty, without shelter or safety this day. Guide us to share of what we have so that all people may dwell in your abundance. God, in your love, hear our prayer. We celebrate and give thanks this day for the ability to be together. We remember those who are traveling and pray for their safe return. We remember all those who rejoice as we rejoice with them. God, in your love, hear our prayer. Gracious God, there is so much noise and so many distractions in our world. And so we come before you now in a moment of silence as we welcome you and all those participating in this worship service into our hearts. Loving God, in all these things that we have prayed out loud and in all of the prayers that remain in our hearts, we lift them up to you in the name of the living one who taught us to say together. Our God, our God who are in heaven, hallowed, hallowed be thy God. name. Your, your kingdom name. come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever Amen. and ever. Amen. Amen. Hello, everyone. Before we start diving into the text, I want to situate this particular passage within the larger context 
of Jesus's life. This comes in Matthew chapter 11. At this point, Jesus has already been baptized by John the Baptist. His ministry has begun. He is healing people. He is exercising demons. He is giving public, public banquets for tax collectors and sinners. He is a well-known figure in the community. And John the Baptist is currently in Herod Antipas's prison. And he is wondering at this point if Jesus is the Messiah. Now, he sends them to Jesus to ask this question. Are you the one who is to come, or are we to wait for another? This question is particularly strange or weird, considering what John's followers and disciples would have already known. Most of them probably would have heard that John was preparing the way for a Messiah. Most of them would have been present when Jesus was baptized. They would have known that God came down and the spirit entered into Jesus and that God said, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. I am not sure what other signs they would have needed. On top of that, Jesus gives a list of all of the signs that he has done, which of course are all his miracles. He has given the blind their sight. He has given um, mobility back to the lame. He has cleansed those who are considered lepers. The deaf can hear again. He has raised people from the dead and he has given good news to the poor. So what were the people of John's discipleship, discipleship looking for? That's the question. What signs were they expecting and what signs did they want? Well, first we have to consider that John the Baptist and his followers were probably a part of a sectarian group, a separatist group called the Essenes. And whether they were part of that group or merely uh, trained by that group, they had an apocalyptic vision of what was to come. They believed that a Messiah would come to earth, that this Messiah would restore Israel to its former glory, that Israel would be purified and cleansed of its enemies, and that a new day of God would reign upon earth. Now, if you think about it, much of this theology comes from Malachi chapter 3, verse 5, which says that the people of earth, God's people, will be cleansed and purified. And I imagine that John and his followers believed that this new age would first be marked by God's judgment upon those who they considered to be their enemies. But if you look at Jesus' ministry, you don't see a lot of judgment. Instead, you see him healing people. You see him exercising demons. You see him holding public banquets. And really, there isn't much judgment. The only time that Jesus actually passes judgment is when he is speaking out against the self-righteous and the political and religious elite of the time. But I want to stop for a moment. I want us to sympathize with John just for a second. He is in prison, in prison for his message and for his ministry. And it is human to, under, to, to be wondering, when is God going to free the people of Israel from their oppression? When is he going to drive the Roman oppressors out of the Holy Land? And if you look at Jesus's ministry, at least at this point, he wasn't doing much to disturb the Roman Empire or to disturb Herod. Antipas and his reign in Jerusalem. So it makes sense that John would have been a bit confused. Now, the answer to his doubts, and let's be honest, there also are doubts very often, comes in how we interpret Jesus's ministry and how we interpret the miracles that he was performing. We have to ask ourselves this question. Was Jesus just healing a few lucky people? Are we to read these miracles as just simple miracles for a lucky group of people, and that now that Jesus is gone, the healing has ended? Or are we to see this as more metaphorical and allegorical? Are we to see that not only were those select few healed and given their sight back and given their mobility back, 
and given good news? Or is it that all of us live in a state of blindness and a state of deafness, and that over time, all of our eyes are being opened and our ears being opened to God's good news? If that is the case, that kind of healing, that kind of reconciliation doesn't take place in the matter of hours or days. It takes lifetimes for the individual and generations for people and societies as a whole to be open and willing to hear God's good news, which of course is based on love. Not only love for your friends and family, but also love for your enemies and those you call your enemies. Today, I ask you, what signs are you looking for? How do you mark God's presence in your life? Are you looking for things that are worldly? Are you looking at the stock market or the 401k? Are you looking at your local or your national news? Are you looking at what's on television and what's in the movie theater? Heck, are you walking down the streets of Portland? Are those the places that you are looking for signs that God is present and doing good work? If that is the case, I don't think that you will always find God, even though if you look in the right places, you might find him. Those outlets of media are designed to keep us agitated and frustrated and scared. They only present the negative because they know that the negative sells. However, if we are to be God's blessed people, we must look elsewhere. Now let's take a longer view of history. And as MLK says, notice that the arc of history is long, but to also accept that it bends towards justice, okay? If you consider that just, just a little bit over 150 years ago, people in the United States still held people as slaves. If you consider the number of people who have been given the right to vote in the last 100 years, if you consider all the suffering that has been brought to light and the number of people who today are fighting against that suffering, then you may see that God is present and that more good is happening than bad and that the average person is more dedicated to love and justice than they might have been 100, 200, 500, or 1,000 years ago. We have to train ourselves to look for progress where progress is. And yet, we, just like John's disciples, may be looking in the wrong place. We may be looking for signs that aren't the right ones. So today and this week, I want you to avert your eyes from that darkness, and I want you to look for the good in people, to look for the good in our institutions, and to look for the good in our world. You know, look at the teacher who is spending extra hours to make that perfect lesson or to help that child in crisis. Look towards our doctors and our nurses and everybody else in the medical field who are working overtime to make sure people get the surgeries and the prescriptions they need to be healthy. Look at your neighbors who are taking their elderly neighbors to the hospital and to doctor's appointments, even though they don't have to. Look at those who are walking the streets of Portland to hand out food, to, to, to get the homeless to shelters, and to help those generally in need. Look at those who are planting trees. Look at those who are donating to their churches and their schools and charities. Look at our local libraries and all the services they provide. Look at the mental health services that are now readily available online for those who can't drive. There are so many good things happening in this world. And yet, if you're only trained to look for the negative, you will never see the positive. I want to end by reminding you all of the great things that this church here is doing. Only a few weeks ago, we fed hundreds of people with your amazing donations. The last I heard, more than 250 people generously gave money to our ministry here at Clackamas United Church of Christ. And we are now in a position to help more and more people, to feed more people, to make so many more people smile and feel happy this holiday season. That can't go unnoticed. 
that can't be deprioritized over something crazy that's happening at the national level or the international level. So again, I pray that all of you will continue to look for the goodness in the world to continue practicing gratitude and thankfulness because God is here with us right now, blessing us, healing us, restoring us, and purifying us. As we reach the third week of Advent and as we approach the day of Christmas, it is not just metaphorical that we say that we await the birth of Jesus. The historical Jesus has been born, but the Jesus that lives within us is still waiting to be born. And so as we move toward Christmas, I hope that that side of our spirituality, that side of our personality, that side of our heart will be awakened and reborn because there is so much good to see if only you can see through the eyes of God. Thank you, everyone. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and bring you peace and bring you peace this day and forevermore. Well, friends, that is it for our worship service today. Thank you so much for being here. I hope you have a wonderful and joyful week. And uh, we, uh, if you want to join us for coffee hour, uh, you can do so at the Zoom link in the comment section there. And uh, until next week, everybody, may you know that you are loved. May you share that love with others. And uh, as always, whenever it is necessary, may you make like John Lewis and go out there and cause some good trouble. Until next week, God be with you all.